Hello, my brothers and sisters in Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms, the 103rd book of Psalms. And this is a Psalm of King David, and we're going to be reading, starting there at that first verse. And it reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgiveth all thine iniquities and healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He have not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. And may the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come in the name of Jesus and we are so thankful again to be able to hear your holy word. We're so thankful, O oh God, because we know that it is your word that you sent to heal us. It is your word that delivers us. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, for his blood that was shed for the remission of our sins and for the precious gift of the Holy Spirit, whereby we're sealed unto the day of redemption. We're asking today, O oh God, that you will send your word to accomplish what you send it to do, that it will not return to you void. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you will enlighten the eyes of our understanding open in our hearts and our minds to receive, to comprehend your truth. It is in Jesus' name that we thank you, O oh God, because your word is true. Amen. I thank God for this word. This psalm should be broken down verse by verse because in hearing it, King David, I am sure, penned it with compassion and a great love in humility and thankfulness to God, our Heavenly Father. Focusing on the good things that God had or was doing for him, he rejoiced. Now, we know that King David went through a lot of things, experienced a lot of things in his life, hurt, pain, highs, lows, good, bad, everything. He could have complained, and we can too. But when we consider how we obtain God's forgiveness of, for our sins, how we obtain healing for our bodies and redemption for our souls and the true fact that we receive all this without deserving, as the scripture says, any of them. We should be thankful and counting our blessings every day. And this is something that King David knew because King David, as you all know, was a praiser. He knew how to touch God's heart with his praise and his worship and his thanksgiving. And in looking at the scriptures, verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. The Amplified Bible says, Affectionately, gratefully, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is deep or deepest within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. While studying scriptures um, in the New Testament about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit led me to various scriptures in the Old Testament. And I think this is a good thing, too, because it's good to remember. And he did this to bring uh, to my remembrance and to show me that God's love and his mercy and his grace for his chosen people has never changed. We looked at Genesis, the 12th chapter, in that first through the third verse, where God told Abram to leave his country his people, and his father's house and go to a land that God said he would show him. He said, I will make of thee a great nation or people. Bless thee and make thy name great. He told Abram that he would be a blessing 
and God himself would bless them that bless thee and curse him that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We also looked at Genesis, the 26th chapter, the second through the third and the fifth verse, where the Lord appeared unto Isaac, which was Abraham's son in Gerah, and said, don't go down to Egypt. Stay in this land and I will be with thee and favor you with blessings. For unto you and your seed, I will give all these countries and will perform the oath or promise I made to Abraham, thy father. And the reason for this is in verse five, where it says, because that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandment, my statutes and my laws. We look at Genesis, the 35th chapter, the first through the third verse, and I hope you're writing all of these down, where God told Jacob, Isaac's son, to go to Bethel and make an altar unto him, at which time Jacob said to his household, put away the images of strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your clothes and let us arise and go up to Bethel and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress or troubles and the God who was with me wherever I went. And if you look at verses nine and 10, you'll read uh, how God appeared to Jacob again and blessed him and said unto him, thy name is Jacob, but not anymore, but Israel shall be thy name. We looked at Genesis, the 45th chapter, where Joseph, Israel's son, who was sold into Egypt by his jealous brothers, made himself known unto his brethren. He said in verse five, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Verse 8 says, So now it was not you that sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, the Lord of all his house, and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. But according to the scriptures, after Joseph, who lived to be 110 years old, died, the scripture said in Exodus, the first chapter and the eighth verse, that there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And this king, O Pharaoh, according to the scriptures, was worried about the growth and power of Israel, God's people, saying in verse 10, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join unto our enemies. So he said over them taskmasters, to afflict them with burdens. He spake to the Hebrew midwives, verse 15, Shipra and Korah, and told them to kill all the baby boys. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and let the male babies live. So we looked at Exodus, the second chapter, in that first verse that talked about Amram, a man of the tribe of Levi, who married Jaebed, a daughter of the tribe of Levi. Verse two states that she conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. When she could not hide him any longer, she made him a basket, put the child in it, and placed him in the reeds by the river's edge. According to the scriptures, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself and found the child. And listen, he was nursed by his own mother. You have to read the word to get all the understanding of it. It's a good reading. Verse 10 states that the child grew, was brought to Pharaoh's daughter and became her son. And because she drew him out of the water, she called his name Moses. Now, this Moses, when he was grown or became an adult, Verse 12 tells us that he looked this way and that way. And when he saw that there was no man, the scripture says that he killed an Egyptian and hid his body in the sand. And when Pharaoh heard this, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses, according to verse 15, fled from the presence of Pharaoh and dealt in the land of Midian. 
And there in the land of Midian, the scripture says that he found a wife. And when you get to chapter three, verse one, it tells us that he kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, who was the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Verse two says, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. And according to the scriptures, when God saw that he, Moses, turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush, revealed to him that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the God of Jacob and said in verse 7 that he had seen the affliction of his people in Egypt, that he had heard their cry and knew their sorrows, and that he had came down or come down to deliver them. He said to Moses, come now therefore, verse 10, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. It's some good reading, amen. Read the word. It's the living word, amen. Filled with a lack of confidence, God assured Moses that he was with him. From here, God used Moses to do great and mighty things. And you can read in the scriptures how he actually led the people out of Egypt after great mighty wonders were done in Egypt. And then when Moses got to the Mount of God, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. You can find that in Exodus, the 20th chapter, the first through the 17th verse. This was important because God's word reveals a clear picture of his character and his will for his people. It is even more clear when he sent Jesus Christ, his son, who stated in John, the 14th chapter, the sixth verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Talking about the word of God. Romans the 10th chapter, that 8 verse says, But what saith it? The word is near thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach. God's word, that's why it's so important that we read the word, that we hear the word, that we listen to the word, that we obey the word, because God's word is the way or guide preparing us to honor him with our lives. His word teaches us how to change and how to be different, making us a peculiar treasure unto God above all people, a kingdom of priests and a holy people set apart. That's why he said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, because there should be some kind of a difference between you and the world, between someone who is saved and someone who is not saved. There should be a difference in the heart, in the mind, in the attitude, in the disposition, in the way you walk, in the way you live, in the way you talk. Hallelujah. It should be a difference. And when we consider, again, Psalms 103, starting at that second verse, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Listen, his loving kindness and tender mercies, good things like family, children, a loving relationship, or peace of mind. Verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide or punish. He will not always be angry or hold a grudge. God's love, his mercy, and his grace for us is so solid, like a rock, that Paul said in Romans the 8th chapter, in that 38th verse, that he was persuaded, completely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But listen, anger, 
are holding grudges will. And when you think about that, being angry or holding grudges or not being willing to forgive or not being willing to accept someone asking you to forgive them or being bitter or angry towards someone. And I find this day and time, it is so evident in families, in neighbors, in co-workers, in friends. It is so evident. We still have the smile on our face, but in our hearts and in our minds, if they could read our thoughts, oh my God, it would be truly amazing. But the scriptures lets us know that anger and holding grudges will separate us from him. We have to always be mindful of God's mercy and his grace. Because according to verse 10, he has not dealt with us after or according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Now you think about that. Out of all the things that you have done in your life, out of all the things that you have said in your life, he has not dealt with you after or according to your sins, nor rewarded you according to your iniquities. Many of us should or could have been dead a long time ago. Many of us should or could have been in a car wreck that was so bad that you wished you were dead. It should or could have been your body full of sickness or disease. It could or should have been your marriage or relationship that was destroyed. It should or could have been your children missing, locked up, or molested. It could have been your home that went into foreclosure or your property that was destroyed. Think about it. God is so good. He is so faithful. He is so worthy, hallelujah, to be praised. He is so anointed. He is so glorious in everything that he does. His mercy is great towards them that fear him those that respect and worship him. And thank God, we have to thank God that trouble does not last always. We have to believe that God is able to do the impossible. We have to believe that there is nothing too hard for him. His love for us, as I said earlier, is solid as a rock. And he sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, to help us. Everything that we need is in that word. Everything that we need, once we're quickened in our spirit, made alive spiritually, everything that we need is in his word. The east and the west will never meet. So David said in verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And we know this to be even more true this day and time because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He paid the price for each and every one of us. He died and we died. He rose again from the dead and we rose again from the dead. So he took care of all of this for us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear, respect, and honor him. Now, not every child has or have had a loving and compassionate father. And life itself, abuse, dysfunction, selfishness, and sin in general, rob children and even adults of loving parents. And even now, when you think about it, people were just having sex. No one was thinking about a baby or the consequences. So the evidence of our sin was born into struggle or was the cause of the struggle. Then others would never know about it because an abortion destroyed all the evidence of life. But to those who are dealing with or have dealt with abuse or rejection all your life, God offers himself to you to be that father or mother you never had, 
but never knew. And you can receive his love and forgiveness for your sins in your heart. Why? Because only God can truly heal. Only he knows our frame. Verse 14 says that he remembers that we are dust. We are fragile, but God's mercy endures forever. God knows what we are. He created us. Only he knows our frame. Verse 14 says that he remembered that we are dust. We are fragile, but God's mercy endures forever. God knows what we are, what we're capable of. Capable of. He created us, and that's why our weakness should never be used as a justification for sin. His mercy takes everything into account. He knows our past, present, and our future. There are so many that are bound up, taken captive, enslaved to lust, sex, drugs, pornography, gambling, alcohol, incest, hatred, jealousy, control, anger, the thoughts of suicide and the pain and the struggle goes on. But God sent his word to heal us. And that's what we need to think about. It. He sent his word to heal us, to deliver us from the power of sin and death. And if we acknowledge and confess that we need help, that we want to be free. God's process is guaranteed. His love covers a multitude of sin. And even if there is evidence of the consequences of your actions, God is faithful and he will help in the time of trouble. Remember verse 10, he has not dealt with us not truly after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. We can be changed in our mind and behavior. This is so important because that's what he desires. He desires to get the sin out of us, death out of us, and put goodness in us and life in us. And yet only a foolish person will continue doing the same thing expecting a different result. As for me, I will bless the Lord, praise him with a thankful heart, whisper sweet things to him because he is the lover of my soul. He forgives all our iniquities and heals all types of diseases. He redeemed our lives from destruction, crowned us with loving kindness and tender mercies satisfied our mouth with good things. And the Amplified Bible says your necessities and desires at your personal age and situation so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles, making us stress-free, strong, overcoming, and soaring. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Our God, is to be praised by all that he has created. Verse 19 says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. His angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments and listen to the voice of his word, they will bless the Lord. His host, ministers of his that do his pleasure, they will bless the Lord. Verse 22 says, all his works in all places of his dominion will bless the Lord. And we too, that are blood washed and spirit filled, should bless affectionately and gratefully praise the Lord with all our soul. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Father, we come in the name of Jesus and we are truly thankful for the reading and the hearing of your holy word. We are truly thankful, O oh God, for your grace and your mercy and for the great love that you love us. 
We are so thankful that we are on a solid foundation, a rock, a sureness. Our soul is anchored in you, O oh God, in your word. And we're so thankful for that. We're so thankful that you allowed us to go back and to remember your goodness, O oh God how you led your people forth, oh God. There's so much good in the word. And I pray that just what we talked about or read on today would just encourage someone to move upon the heart of someone to say, you know what, I want to read that again. But God, I thank you. I truly praise you. And again, I ask that you will move by your spirit to have mercy upon the souls of men that you will forgive us for our sins because we all have sinned, O oh God, and come short of your glory. We all have erred from your truth. We all have missed the mark. And for those, O oh God, who are yet suffering in their bodies, even because of their disobedience or even because of something that they have uh, done or said or thought in their life that is now coming back upon them, I ask that you will have mercy in the name of Jesus. And even, O oh God, if it is that you are just chastening them, because you chasten those that you love in hopes that they will acknowledge you and return to you, laying aside every sin and wait that they may honor you with their lives. I pray that you would move upon them and awake them out of sleep. Heavenly Father, you are good and you are faithful to your word. I remember reading what you said in your word that as good and as you went and as willing as you were to bless your people, you will be just as happy to destroy them. But you are wonderful, oh God, and we love you and we need you. And for many, Heavenly Father, they're still struggling. They're still wavering. They're still undecisive. But I pray in the name of Jesus that you will send your word and allow that word to accomplish what you send it to do. We thank you for your healing virtue. We thank you, oh God, for delivering us. We thank you for strengthening us. We thank you for encouraging us. There's so many distractions, so much going on in the world today, but you are still God. We know that people are calling right, wrong, and wrong, right. That there are those, oh God, who are murdering innocent people, going about doing things, oh God, that's just unthinkable. But you are in control. And so we ask that you will continue to be in the midst, that you will continue to protect, you will continue to help and strengthen. And those, oh God, that you know, that love you and fear you, I pray that you will bless them. And it is in Jesus' name that we thank you. Amen. <laughs>